The Judiciary Committee will come to order. Uh, before we resume our questioning, I'd like to welcome the newest member of the committee, Jared Polis, from the Second District of Colorado. Uh, Congressman Polis was just appointed yesterday to fill a vacancy on the committee, and uh, we are happy uh, to welcome him back. He was on the committee for several years and is back on now. He also serves on the Rules Committee and the House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. And at our next meeting, we'll even go into more details about uh, Mr. Polis, but we welcome him today and uh, we'll be recognizing you immediately for questions. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, draw your attention, Mr. Attorney General, to um, uh, the issues surrounding uh, the regulation of medical marijuana. Um, I wanted to first clarify that there's a, a memo dated October 19, 2009 from David Ogden. I'm sure you're familiar with that memo. Uh, the contents of that memo as advisory to the states is, sti are, are, is still in force. Is that correct? That is still a current memo? Yes. Okay, thank you. And one of the, uh, the issues that was later clarified in a, mem in a uh, memo by James Cole is what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about caregivers, who your memo uh, instructs uh, should not be uh, an enforcement priority. Uh, the Colorado Constitution in Article 14 happens to have a definition of caregiver. It's further refined in our Colorado statutes. And I wanted to uh, see whether I can get your assurance that our definition of caregiver in our state's constitution will be given some deference uh, by the U.S. Attorney General's office. I'm not familiar with the provision, um, but what we said in the memo we still intend, which is that uh, given the limited resources that we have, uh, and if there are states that, are, uh, that have uh, medical marijuana provisions, and if you take into account the, the coal uh, uh, memo, if in fact people are not using um, the uh, policy decision that we have made uh, to use marijuana in a way that's not consistent with the state statute, we will not use our, our limited resources in, in that way. And so. Uh, Sure. I don't know. If, I assume that I just don't know about that provision. And, and again, yeah, in the case of Colorado, we do have definitions of some of the terms in your documents in our in our constitution. And I, I would hope that this, this, the U.S. Attorney General for the state would look at that. Now, as you know, the Department of Justice that recently announced a crackdown uh, in California. Now, part of the issue there, it's my understanding, they did not have a functional state level regulatory authority. Colorado does have an extensive state regulatory and licensing system for medical marijuana, uh, and I'd like to ask whether our, our state regulation, our thoughtful state regulation passed with strong bipartisan majorities in both chambers of our legislature, uh, provide uh, any additional protection to Colorado uh, from federal intervention. Well, again, I'd have to, I'm not familiar with it, but I'd have to, to look at it. But, uh, but again, our thought was that where a state has taken uh, uh, a, a position as a passed a law, and people are acting in conformity with the law, not abusing the law, but acting in conformity with it. Um, and again, given our limited resources, that would not be an enforcement priority for the Justice Department. Thank you. I'm grateful for that clarification. Uh, one of the issues that many of the uh, legal regulated um, medical marijuana shops and dispensaries in Colorado have brought to my attention is their inability to open banks to bank accounts at most FDIC institutions. Uh, that makes the industry harder for the state to, tra to track, to tax, to regulate, uh, and uh, in fact uh, makes it prone to robberies because it becomes a cash business as well. Uh, is there any intention of the Department of Justice to prosecute bankers for doing business with licensed and regulated uh, medical marijuana providers in the states? Again, I would think that consistent with our, the notion that how we use our limited resources, again, if the bankers, the people seeking to make the deposits are acting in conformity with state law, that would not, again, be an enforcement priority for, uh, for, DOJ, for the Justice Department. Thank you. Uh, moving on to another issue with regards to uh, uh, Internet piracy. As you know, the Judiciary Committee recently held hearings on SOPA. Uh, Stop Online Piracy Act. I have many concerns with this bill, including a overly broad definition of infringement. Um, as you know, there is uh, a lot of content on the internet. In fact, as an example, on uh, YouTube alone, there's 100 hours of video that's uploaded every minute. Uh, many of this, uh, many of the videos that have been uploaded contain some type of rights infringement uh, with no intent for commercial gain. Uh, I ask with substantial new powers that would be granted to the Attorney General's office under SOPA, uh, what type of resources would the Department of Justice need to handle the hundreds of millions of prosecutions that would be necessary uh, and indicated under SOPA? Well, I mean, I, I think that you have to look at what the, uh, 
what powers we would be granted and then how we would use our resources. Not every matter, um, though it might be a technical violation of a statute, is something that we are going to use our resources going against. I mean, if there's a YouTube upload of something that um, is not intended for commercial use and we don't think there is any great harm, that's not the kind of so, thing that we're going to be going after. So it's fair to say, given otherwise the absence of tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of resources to go after everybody, there would be selective enforcement of the Stop Online Piracy Act from the Attorney General's office? Well, selective enforcement always, you know, a prosecutor get a little, get a little nervous saying that phrase, but um, there would be an appropriate use of our resources, um, taking into account what the harm is and w always with the thought that what we're trying to do is to uh, protect the, the abuse of uh, copyrighted material. I would thank the gentleman and just note that uh, with regard to the uh, so, so selective enforcement, uh, there is not currently criteria in the bill, so that would be at the discretion of your office uh, to decide what type of selective enforcement of that law and the new powers would be given to the Attorney General under that would entail, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Post. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Holder, Assistant Attorney General Ronald Weich wrote a letter to a member of Congress, February 2011, a letter which was demonstrably false. Your department withdrew that letter 10 months later. When did you learn that that letter was false? Well, I would not characterize the letter as false. I'd say it contained inaccuracies. Well. Mr. Attorney General, it contained material, demonstrably false statements. Agreed? No. You don't think they're demonstrably false when you represent that ATF makes an effort to interdict all weapons going to Mexico? You don't think that's demonstrably false? Not in the way you use the word. Um, you said. Well, how do you know what way I use the word? I'm listening to you. I I is it false? Can I demonstrate that it's false? Well, uh, you said materially false. Now, you're, you're using legal terms there. You're a lawyer, and, and so you're now, now we're, in that, we're in that realm. And you said materially false, and that's a fundamentally different thing. All right. Do you think it was demonstrably false? I would say that it was inaccurate. All right. When did you learn that it was inaccurate, demonstrably false? You know, I'm not sure, but I had concerns about it um, early enough that um, – in spite of the expression in, on February 4th, I ordered that investigation on February the 28th, and as uh, it, it was an evolving process, as time went on, um, more and more information became available, and it became more and more clear that that uh, letter contained inaccurate information. Well, it, it strikes me that if a statement that false were made to a judge, you would have withdrawn that statement, that brief, that memo, that filing, the moment that you learned it was false. Well, there are and I'm just curious why there's not the same regard for this branch of government that there would be for the judicial branch of government. Well, if you look at what happened over the course of months between the time of the letter until it was formally withdrawn, there were a number of uh, instances where uh, we indicated that we had concerns about what was in the letter uh, in, a test in testimony that Mr. Weitz gave. At one point, I believe he says we are not I don't remember the exact expression that he used, but he indicated there that we had concerns. In a letter that I sent, I guess, in October, uh, I indicated there were problems with Fast and Furious, which was inconsistent with what the letter said. There are a number of things that happened between February 4th and, I guess, December, November, whenever it is that we actually well, withdrew. Let's go back to February 4th, because there are at least four senior DOJ officials who knew or should have known that letter was false at the time it was delivered. Your chief of staff, Gary Grindler saw a, a map of Mexico where guns were being recovered. He was debriefed on Fast and Furious. He knew that cash was being paid for the weapons in Arizona. Uh, Lanny Brewer, you will concede, knew for a fact that gun walking was taking place in February of 2011. Agreed? No. You, do, you disagree that Lanny Brewer, despite the fact that he's admitted it, knew that gun walking was taking place by ATF. Mr. Attorney General, there are emails where he admitted it in October of 2010. Hey, now, Congressman, you have to be careful here. He said that he knew about gun walking in Operation um, Wide Receiver. Right, which is why it's very important. Mr. Weitz didn't fast say furious. fast and furious in his letter to, to, to Senator Grassley. 
I, I see where you're going with that. He didn't make a distinction no, on Fast and Furious. I'm just trying to be careful here. And I want to be we careful, to, too. You don't want to conflate things. I, I'm not conflating. Okay. Did Lanny Brewer know that ATF engaged in gun walking in February of 2011? He knew that they had, they had engaged in gun walking in the, fa in the uh, wide receiver operation. So the answer to that question would be yes. Lanny Brewer knew that any statement that ATF makes every effort to interdict guns and not allow them to go to Mexico, he knew that statement would have been false. Well, he has said that he made a mistake in not connecting that which he knew about wide receiver and didn't apply that knowledge to um, what well, happened in fact. What about Jason Weinstein and James Trusty? This is their email exchange. It's a tricky case given the number of guns that have walked. That's October two, 2010. Trusty responds, it's not going to be any surprise that a bunch of U.S. guns are being used in Mexico, so I'm not sure how much grief we get for gun walking. These aren't AUSAs in Arizona. These aren't rogue ATF agents. These are senior DOJ officials, and I cannot believe that, that they just learned recently that a demonstrably false letter had been mailed to a member of Congress. Why not correct it the moment you realized that it was wrong? Well, they admit that they made mistakes with regard to what their level of knowledge was and what they should have done in the preparation of the letter. They relied on people who they thought had the best knowledge in Arizona uh, and did not bring into their calculation information that they had previously had about uh, the gun walking that had occurred in that pr prior operation. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, you brought um, several law enforcement officials with you today, and I salute their service. Um, it just strikes me, uh, and I'm quite confident I'll get this question when I go back home. Uh, when law enforcement officers lie to lawyers, they go to jail. When lawyers lie to Congress, they seem to get promoted. There's a Border Patrol agent who is on his way to federal prison right now on a 1001 conviction. What consequences can we expect? because of false statements made to Congress. The chairman's time has expired, and if the Attorney General will respond to the question. Well, as I said, there is an Inspector General investigation that is underway. Uh, I'll look at the results of that investigation, but I'll also be looking to see what happened with regard to the creation of that letter, if there's any more information that uh, I can glean on my own before making determinations as to how people will be held accountable for uh, the mistakes that, uh, that they made. And taking into account in making that determination, uh, what roles have they played in the department? What good things have they done? I mean, one cannot look at these mistakes, I think, in isolation. One has to look at the totality of the person's service to the department and then on that basis make a determination as to what the appropriate sanction will be. And that's what I'll do. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent for 15 seconds just so I can follow up on one point. And Chairman continues to be recognized for 15 seconds. Mr. Attorney General, it just seems to me that, that the policy is now going to be let's get the least knowledgeable person that we can to write the letter. I found the exchange between you and Chairman Sensenbrenner to be interesting on mens re. The defense is that Mr. Weich didn't know what he didn't know, so we're going to get the least knowledgeable person in the Department of Justice to write the letters to members of Congress. Is that what we can expect from now on? No, what you could expect from this Department of Justice, as long as I'm the Attorney General, is that we will do our best to get you accurate information as quickly as we can. And I actually think that one of the problems with regard to the Fast and Furious response is that we were rushed. That people, although if you look at you know, that email, all those emails that we sent around, you see that people are really interacting with one another, trying to find information. But I think there was a time pressure there that, frankly, they should not have allowed in the process. They should have taken more time, sent a placeholder response or something like that. And if it took two weeks to um, get a response back to Congress, that would have been better than, I think, the four or five days um, that it took. I think that is it's certainly one of the problems. And there was a lesson learned. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gowdy. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Holder, welcome. Thank you for spending the day with us. Thank you for your candid responses. Uh, I, would, um, I would note that sometimes facts get in the way of political theatrics, and I, I appreciate your willingness to share facts with us today. Uh, I'd like to just revisit this discussion by taking a step back for a minute, General. Uh, can you since we've, we've delved into the weeds, can we back up for a second? When did you, when did you learn about Operation Fast and Furious? 
Um, sometime at the beginning of the year, uh, it, was, it would have been, I think, after I got those letters from um, Senator Grassley on January the 31st, and at some point after that, I think sometime in February, I first heard about Operation Fast and Furious. And uh, what, what did you tell the U.S. Attorney's offices? What, what notice did you send them when you learned of this? Um, after uh, I ordered the uh, Inspector General investigation in March, I sent a directive to all of the U.S. Attorney's offices that uh, gun walking uh, was not, accept not an acceptable uh, technique or tactic, uh, that it was contrary to DOJ policy. I had the Deputy Attorney General send that out to uh, all of the U.S. Attorneys. And that, that was after you ordered the investigation? Uh, and tell me about the investigation that you ordered. The order uh, for the investigation was on February the 28th. Uh, I thought that I was getting conflicting information from people within the Department of Justice and what I was reading in the media and, frankly, what Congress was bringing to my attention. And it just seemed to me um, that I needed to have a, find a mechanism uh, to finally resolve what these conflicting positions. And as a result, I, ordered the, uh, uh, in, I asked the Inspector General to engage in this investigation. What's, uh, and what's the, the time frame of that investigation? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, they are, I, they, I know they're feverishly working on it. When it will actually be completed, I don't know. Um, I appreciate that. There are 64,000 guns in, in Mexico is the number that I understand. 95% of the weapons recovered from murders in Mexico, 95% were traced to the United States. Tens of thousands of weapons were traced to the United States. Uh, it is... Uh, this discussion is, uh, is vitally important, but I think it's equally important for us to broaden the discussion to, to one of how to address the fact that there are still tens of thousands of weapons that are winding up uh, in Mexico from our border. Uh, can you speak, General, to the actions that Congress can take in order to help stem that, that flow of guns? Well, I, I think certainly... If Congress were supportive of our funding requests to uh, help ATF um, with these, uh, these teams that we would like to send to the border, we tried to send 14 at one point, and I think we only sent seven or eight because of funding problems. These ATF teams that have an ability uh, to monitor the trafficking uh, of weapons into Mexico, that would be helpful. Um, there is uh, a trafficking statute. If Congress would pass that, consider and pass that, I think that could help us as well. Um, support for that regulation that we put in place that deals with um, long guns and the sale of them uh, over the course of you know, a five-day period. All, all of these things, I think, would be, would be helpful. And I, a more protracted dialogue about what the nature of the problem is, which is a national security threat to the United States, um, you know, it, it's not only the executive branch that has ideas that I think could be useful. I'm sure there are great ideas in Congress as well, and to the extent that we can identify them, work on them, um, and do so in a way that's uh, respectful of and consistent with the Second Amendment, I think that would be very useful. Uh, I agree. I also uh, would suggest, General, that it's worth broadening the, this debate to, uh, to within our own borders as well. Uh, I think it is worth noting that 100,000 people a year in America are involved, are shot in gun violence. 32,000 died from gun violence last year. 20,000 American children and teens are shot every year involved in gun violence. Every day in America, 270 people in America, 47 of them children and teens, are shot. And every day, 87 people die from gun violence in this country. Uh, we, uh, this is a very important hearing, and this is an important discussion about uh, this, uh, this uh, operation, the investigation that you've started. Uh, I think, unfortunately, the debate that we're not having often enough here is one about gun violence in this country, is one that acknowledges the fact that law enforcement officers in our country uh, now need to carry assault weapons themselves in order to match the firepower of the criminals who carry assault weapons. There was a survey done of, of about two dozen police departments by the International Association of Chiefs of Police that since 2004, all of the agencies have either added assault weapons to patrol units or replaced existing weapons with military-style assault rifles. Military-style assault weapons are now necessary. They're needed by our police officers because assault weapons uh, are flowing freely within our own borders. And while this discussion is important, 
Uh, we live in a country where the assault weapon ban has expired and we see assault weapons now flowing through the streets causing our law enforcement to have to carry assault weapons. The gun show loophole continues uh, to exist and it is about time, and I say this only rhetorically, I don't ask for your response, General, but it is about time that we focus as a Congress on the steps that we need to take to, to decrease gun violence in this country and to get these assault weapons that are created for the sole purpose of killing people off of our streets once and for all. Uh, I very much appreciate your being here, and I appreciate this exchange, General. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deutsch. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Attorney General, I thank you for being here. I know it's been a rather long day uh, for all of us. And I just want to clarify your understanding of your being here today, because there was some confusion, I think, at the beginning. Is it your understanding that you're here under oath? that you're under penalties of perjury as to your testimony? I'm here to tell the truth, sure. Okay. So you are, you, you believe that you're here under oath. Is that your understanding? I'm not sure I'm technically under oath, but I have an obligation to tell the truth. I need to, to Congress. wear yes, an oath. Sir. I'm here to tell the truth. Thank you. I, I, I hope so. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm not sure should, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. I want you to tell the truth. <laughs> because I want to ask you a little bit about your management style. All right. You know, it looks as though that, um, you have uh, not really been reading any of the memos that you get on Fast and Furious. In fact, I think that uh, uh, your chief of staff, Ken Olson, has testified before the Senate Judici Com Judiciary Committee that he also did not read the mo memo sent to, his, to your attention regarding Fast and Furious. And I'm just curious, why would that be? I'm, you learn about this operation sometime after the first of the year this year, and yet it's been going on for a year. You're the number one law enforcement, in this, uh, enforcement officer in this country, and you, you don't know what's going on. That, that would make me upset if I was in your position. Does it not you? We've well, got to understand these memos that uh, you're talking about are weekly reports that come to the Office of the Attorney General, the Office of the Deputy Attorney General, and they are statements by the various components of what's going on in them. If you look at the very things that we have submitted to Congress that show what actually dealt with Fast and Furious in those weekly reports. They don't indicate anything about these bad uh, tactics. Okay. It's only about Fast and Furious as if... But somewhere in the line, somewhere in the line of, of, of authority, you've been, you're not new to this, you were in the, the Office of, of Public uh, Integrity what, uh, for, for Public 12 integrity years. Section. 12 yeah, years. been Public Integrity Section for 12 years. You were Deputy Attorney General for, for three years. Four. None of this structure is new to you, and yet, there's somebody below you, and not your chief of staff because he didn't read the memos, but there's somebody who's reading these memos. Sure. Why are they not reporting to you? Because if you read the memos, read them. If you read the memos, you will see, and they're not memos, they're these excerpts. If you read these excerpts about Fast and Furious, all it says is that Fast and Furious essentially is going fine. We're recovering. But did you know what Fast and Furious was at that time? Did you know that it was akin to wide receiver but not the same? No. Did, did you know what Fast and Furious was at all at that time? No, I didn't know about Fast and Furious until but about shouldn't February you have been this known? year. Shouldn't you have known? No, because Fast and Furious is an operation, a regional operation. There are all kinds of operations going on right now in the Justice Department about which I know nothing the, because of the way in which the Department of Justice is structured. They are who specifically by, would have been reading those memos? Do you know by name? Who specifically would have been reading? on my staff. Who, would you, who are their names? The people who, whoever had the portfolio for ATF it, with regard to their weekly memos, NDIC with regard to their weekly memos, those are the people on my staff who would have had that responsibility. Making the initial determination as to whether or not there was information contained in those reports that should be brought to my attention. Would you agree that one of the most fundamental principles of leadership is that you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility? Okay, that sounds about right. And would you be willing then to say that you are responsible for fast and furious operation? As I said, I am ultimately responsible for everything that happens in the Justice Department. Do you have any remorse for what happened with Agent Terry? Of course I do. And have you, have you, 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 you've spoken to their family. Have you apologized to their family? I've had contact with the family that I'm not going to go into. The nature of my uh, interaction with them is between me and them, and I will leave to them uh, how they want to, uh, if they want to reveal that. People on my staff, in addition to me, are in constant touch with the uh, Terry family. But you've not apologized to them, as I understand it. Uh, I will say that I have expressed uh, my feelings to them, and I, I'm going to leave. You're the number one law enforcement officer in this country, 
and a law enforcement officer has died as a result of a batched operation, don't you feel some sense of remorse that you ought to apologize to the family? And I feel great remorse, great regret, and I have expressed this to the Terry family. I'm not going to reveal to you in this setting the nature, just real of, briefly, the and I, and the nature of the interaction that I've had with the Terry then, then let me just ask I'm you something about this your in front opening. of the media. I'm not going to do it in front of a congressional But you haven't apologized. That's all I wanted to establish. Now, you also te testify in your opening statement that, uh, as you state here, that um, uh, using, use, used inflammatory and inappropriate rhetoric about one particular tragedy that occurred near the southwest border in an effort to score political points. Do you feel that somebody is trying to score political points with this incident? With the Fast and Furious yes. incident? <laughs> Well, let's just say that um, some people have not let facts get in the way of... Uh, and, and you're here with clean hands to say that, correct? Excuse me? You're here with clean hands to say that. Because in your, in your opening statement, you also allege, or you assert, that, for example, earlier this year, the majority of House members voted to keep law enforcement in the dark when individuals purchased multiple semi-automatic rifles and shotguns. Mr. Attorney General, it seems to me that you're trying to score as many political points as you're asserting that somebody else has, has done in this operation, and I find that rather offensive. Uh, my, what I've said there is factually accurate. I don't have any problem with people, you know, criticizing me or the department as long as what you say is factually based. That's fine. I mean, I understand that. I'm a big guy. I've been in Washington for a long time. Um, um, the concern I have is where things are uh, thrown at the department generally, at me personally, that are not factually based. That's where I draw the distinction. I see my time is up. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ross. Uh, the gentleman from Puerto Rico, Mr. Pere Luisi, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, General. I'm sorry I, I haven't been able to be here as long as I wished. Uh, I had a parallel hearing I couldn't excuse myself from. Um, but the first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, I should commend you because uh, the little, little time I have been here, I've been watching you, and I... Keep see, I keep seeing that you keep saying, I, as I have said, as I have said, as I have said. And that leads me to believe that you've been asked so many questions, similar questions, and uh, you've had the candor, the demeanor, the patience to deal with them. And that's what we should be expecting and we expect from the Attorney General. And uh, so that's why. I, I thank you and I commend you. Thank you. Um, stay like that, though, because this hasn't finished. <laughs> but uh, I have a couple of questions, a couple of comments. First, um, I am personally concerned about the gun shows and obviously the, the straw purchasers. And so putting aside this fast and furious operation, which you have already denounced and, and you put a stop to it as, as soon as you learned of it, um, what else are you doing to deal with these um, straw purchasers, purchases and, and, and the gun shows that seem to be, you know, like totally unregulated and, 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 and so on? Well, we have tried to make a priority uh, the fight against gun violence, um, and we try to approach it in a, a variety of ways by being um, aggressive in going after those who traffic in um, firearms, to go after uh, those people, convicted felons, for instance, who should not have access to weapons, um, to try to come up with ways in which we keep guns out of the hands of felons. And that's really important because if you look at the number of police officers who have been shot and unfortunately died over the last couple of years, the vast majority of them have been shot by people who were felons and who should not have had access um, to weapons. And so we do a whole variety of things to try to keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. That's good. Um, one thing that bugs me is that for five and a half years, we haven't had a permanent director at, at ATF. Mm -hmm. Yet I see lots of vacancies there. I see them in Puerto Rico, my district, my place. 45% of the uh, slots are vacant even though we have a huge crime issue and, and illegal gun issue. Um, is, is that affecting the level of resources that ATF has? I mean, is this lack of a permanent director affecting its mission, its ability to meet its mission? Yeah, I do think so. I, I think that internally, 
Um, an organization runs better when a person who is seen as the permanent head, the Senate confirmed head, is in charge. I think people respond better, although I think Todd Jones is doing a great job as the acting person now. But beyond that, a person who is Senate confirmed has the ability in the budget process to lobby for um, his or her organization in a way that a person who is doing it in an acting capacity um, cannot. There, you just have more heft within the administration uh, in dealing with Congress if you are the confirmed head. And I think because ATF has been so long without um, a confirmed head, uh, it has not had the ability to argue as forcefully, as effectively as maybe as some of the other components within the department uh, for resources. Going back uh, a bit to this Operation Fast and Furious, I'm the first one who recognizes that Congress has every right to do oversight on this issue and investigate and so on, and I, I know you do too. Um, but one thing that comes to my mind is that uh, the moment you learned of it and you did not get the, the right answers from your troops, that's when you said, I'm referring this to the Inspector General. And as far as I know, the Inspector General doesn't report to you, has wide discretion, His, her objectivity hasn't been questioned. So this is in the proper hands. And is there an investigation ongoing at the moment? And, and, what's, and, and another question I have is, isn't that your modus operandi? When you see any potential irregularity in your department, isn't the Inspector General the place you go to? to try to correct it, and then if there's going to be referrals, administrative actions, then they, they happen? Yeah, I think that was, I thought that was the appropriate thing to do. I, I continue to think it is the appropriate thing to do, to have an independent um, inspector general look at this situation, this flawed operation, uh, and share with me and, and with the rest of the world uh, what her conclusions will be. Um, the Inspector General in the Justice Department uh, has, I think, a deserved reputation for independence. Um, there were a lot of uh, investigations that were done by the IG during the Bush administration that generated, I think, a lot of attention. Um, and uh, I think we're indicative of the kind of independence that the IG is capable of doing when it was making determinations about the Justice Department in which the office sits. And I'm confident that with regard to this matter, the IG will be able to independently review this, as I s described, flawed operation and come up with some uh, facts upon which I can take further action. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I ask you unanimous consent for 15 more seconds. It's going the, to, uh, the gentleman okay. is recognized for another 15 seconds. It's before I, I, I stop, uh, my time has expired, I want to mention to you, Attorney General, that I have uh, uh, requested that ONDCP Director Gil Kurlikowski, the, the drug czar, um, craft a, what I call a Caribbean border initiative, something similar to the Southwestern border initiative. And the reason is, is straightforward. We are in a crisis in the Caribbean, homicides at the worst possible level. More than half of the homicides in Puerto Rico are drug related. The, the situation merits particular attention, a similar initiative to the one you have in the Southwest. I hope I, I will count uh, on your support. The, the point you make is a very good one. Um, the administration has what's called the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative that uh, is in place to deal with the island nations um, in the Caribbean and the problems that they are facing. I was in the Caribbean for four days, um, I guess two or three weeks ago, where I met with four heads of state, um, a variety of attorneys general and interior ministers, uh, to talk about, I was in the Dominican Republic, I was in Barbados, and I was in Trinidad, and I met with, um, uh, as I said, those, those groups of people to deal with the situation that they are talking about. And as Mexico is becoming more successful, uh, drugs are now starting to flow through the Caribbean nations, both to the United States and then to Africa and to Europe. And there are two American territories, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. That's very true. And the right problem there. is one that we have to confront. It is, there's actually, that, this is a, a national security issue that we have to, uh, have to confront. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Pere Luis. The gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Adams, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Holder, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I, I think they're pretty easy yes and no questions. Let's see if we can go that way out. Uh, are you aware of uh, a 1994 uh, implementation DOJ was responsible for? I'm sorry, for I can't hear you too well. 
94, there was an implementation. DOJ was responsible for the implementation of CALEA standards for law enforcement. Are you aware of that? Uh, I'm not sure of the year, but I, I certainly remember CALEA, yeah. Does your agency operate under CALEA standards, or do you just implement them uh, for law enforcement agencies across the state, country? I'm not sure. Do we operate under them? Yes. I mean, do you have that type of, uh, are you accredited? I mean, you accredit, accredit other agencies. Are you following the same type of accreditation guidelines as uh, agencies throughout our nation? I, I assume that we do, yes. Yeah. You assume. So uh, then you would uh, agree that supervisory personnel are accountable for those people that, and the performance of the people underneath them, correct? Yeah, that as a general rule, sure, yes. You know, I listen intently because I'm one of those law enforcement officers. I'm not a lawyer or anything else, and I also have a husband on the wall over in Judiciary Square. I have a lot of friends on that wall, so, so I'm going to come at it a different area. Um, I take issue with you saying that we're trying to make political points with Officer Terry's death. To me, it's personal, okay? It's not political. One of our officers was killed with weapons that were allowed to walk. That should never have happened. I have worked on undercover. We never would allow weapons to walk. Now, I've heard you say, if we get this provision uh, that would the long guns in, it would, it would help. The problem is, under Fast and Furious, it wouldn't have helped, would it? Those weapons still would have walked, wouldn't they? Under Fast and Furious, would they have walked or not? Yeah, one, but one. Yes, not, okay. No, Let's no, move on. No, no, one because does not necessarily preclude the other. I mean, the fact is that under Fast and Furious, a flawed operation, and about which I have not tried to defend the conduct. Correct. That had, I understand that. that is but one under thing. that but system, would they not the have walked? Picture, there's no question that the implementation of that long gun rule will decrease the possibility that we will Mr. have further tragedy. Mr. Attorney General, what my question was, under Fast and Furious, those weapons still would have walked, would they not? The weapons, yes or no? You don't dictate. The weapons would, went and into the flow of commerce because of mistaken decisions that were made by people. Okay, let's talk about those Justice decisions. Department. Let's talk about those decisions. Here we have an operation. You get memos on, but no one, not you nor your chief of staff, is reading those memos. Uh, somewhere along the lines, somebody has to know something because this is an operation that's not just within our borders, it's crossing international borders. So what rises to the level that the Attorney General of our United States needs to know? What is it that you need to know about that rises to that level that you have an operation crossing international borders? You now say that you didn't find out about it until after the fact and after inquiries happened, after Mr. Terry, Officer Terry's death, what is it that would rise to the level that you would have to sign off on? Since going across international borders isn't one of them, could you tell me what would be? Well, first off, you are referring to these as memos. They were weekly reports. Well, any operation. Is there an operation that would rise to the level that would need your sign off? Well, sure, there are things that I have to sign. But on. not this one, the one that crossed international borders. No. Would the general lady bre uh, yield briefly? Could I answer the question first? The, um, what one has to understand is, and, and I would urge you, if you have not done this, to look at these weekly reports and to look at exactly what it was. Mr. Holder, my uh, I understand you had weekly reports, and I'm not, I've got a couple more questions. I want to make sure I get them in. But I'm asking you, and I ask you, what would rise to the level for you to have to sign off on it? Because this apparently did not. You said you had weekly reports that you didn't review, and your chief didn't review. So here is, that's the question I ask, and you said there is, so I'm waiting to hear. But um, while I wait for that answer, let me ask you another question, because one of my colleagues asked you about your emails, and you went straight to your work email. Hardly anybody has that. I'm going to ask you a very direct question. You have a personal email account. Did you at any time, at any time, email on your personal account with Larry Brewer or Lanny Brewer and Gary Grindler in regards to Fast and Furious ever? Or ever? Yes the or no? The gentlewoman is recognized for an additional minute so the Attorney General can respond to her questions. 
I, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that I didn't know. Would anything. you check and get back with us? If you need some help, I'm sure that your agency personnel can get into those computers. Well, with regard to um, <coughs> provision of emails, um, I thought I'd made it clear that after February the 4th, it is not our intention to provide um, email information consistent with the way in which the Justice Department has always conducted itself. The exception that I made, that I made in the hope of that the Justice Department would be seen as transparent was to go against that tradition and to make available deliberative material around the February 4th letter. Uh, so again, and, in a, as in when you were here before and I asked you about a totally different issue, you were saying that you refused to provide that information. Is that correct? I didn't hear the whole, you were talking at the same time I was talking. And please, you didn't have more time. I don't, I'm, I don't want to cut off your time. I'm, I just didn't hear the question. Previously in another committee when you were here earlier, I asked you another question. You said you would not answer that question. Now you're saying that you won't provide those emails because uh, that's not consistent with whatever policy was previous. I'm asking you, if there is clean hands here, will you provide those emails to this committee? As I said. Yes I, or no? I'm going to act in a way that's consistent with all attorneys general before me. That's and, not my question, attorney and, general. I, you know, with due respect, that was not my question. I ask you, with clean hands, would you supply those emails whether it's work-related or personal emails, as they apply to anything that had to do with Fast and Furious, and as I to said, this committee, yes or no? As I said, with regard to the Justice Department as a whole. I yield back. And I Mr. am the Chair, I am not going to get is, the answer. Is, is, as I is, said, with regard to the Justice Department as a whole, and I'm certainly a member of the Justice Department, uh, we will not provide memos uh, after February the 4th. And that is a way in which we are... With seeing. regards to emails, I didn't ask memos, I said emails emails, memos, consistent with the way in which the Department of Justice has always conducted itself in its interaction. What about prior to February 4th? Chairman, so, time has expired. The answer was no. Is that correct, Mr. Attorney General? No, but consistent with the way in which the Justice Department has always conducted itself. This is not something that I am making up in terms of new policy. No, I know, but you used the word not. I took not to be no. Oh, I said no. Okay. I'm saying no, but okay. again, consistent with DOJ policy. I understand. Uh, Mr. Mr. Thank, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Adams. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quayle, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Attorney General Holder, for being here. I want to kind of go back to um, the, the February 4th letter as well that, that Mr. Gowdy was talking about earlier. Because when we were looking over some of the, the emails um, between DOJ, ATF, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix, um, and trying to kind of parse the language of how they're going to respond to Senator Grassley's letter. Uh, I'm not hearing uh, very well on that mic. Okay, okay I'll get in. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things, you know, just parsing the language and figuring out how to respond properly to Senator Grassley in the letter. Um, for me, it kind of looked like you were start that, that group was starting to move into a, not a cover-up mode, but a mode that, that really is more intent on language rather than providing a straightforward uh, response. At any time, wouldn't it have been easier, because the letter was actually addressed to the direct, director, acting director Melson, um, wouldn't it have been easier, and do you know or if anybody else knows, if acting director Melson actually just said, hey, why don't I go in to Senator Grassley, talk to him, brief him, brief his staff on what the operation is all about, rather than relying on somebody who did not have the, t the requisite information to draft a letter that turned out to be factually inaccurate um, that you later had to withdraw? Well, I think a couple of things there. Um, Acting Director Melson actually did come to the uh, committee headed by Chairman Issa on his own. Um, but and that was well after the letter. That's fine. That's letter. fine. That's true. Uh, but he went in there and spoke to them uh, on his own after, before we had scheduled uh, an appointment with him. So he did that on his own. But with regard to the formation or the, uh, the formation of that letter, ATF was intimately involved. If you look at the emails, you will right. see that you have people from ATF at a high level here in, in Washington, as well as ATF people in the field who were involved in the interaction, the, go, the back and forth uh, of that email traffic, trying to get accurate information to send uh, back to that congressional inquiry. Yeah, and I would just say, sometimes it's, it is just easier to just have a, a short briefing in I don't know if, if did, did the acting director offer to go and meet with Senator Grassley at that time? 
Um, and then was he rebuffed and told not to do that? No. Um, uh, I, he was I, not? No, I think what we were doing was responding to a letter that was sent to us and that expected a letter back in response. Well, it did say it's, briefing. I'm just, I'm just curious because I thought that, that would probably be the most efficient use of time and resources rather than the back and forth of making sure that we have the language right. But my guess would be that having the director show up would be the person who would have to get briefed in order to do that, that, to sh that exchange of information. Um, it's probably better to have the people who are lower down and closer to the facts be the ones who were involved. Okay. And if you look at the emails, you will see that that <laughs> it, was the case. And in, in talking about that letter, um, when, do you know when was the last time that the Department of Justice actually had to withdraw a letter that it sent to Congress? I, I don't know. So is it a rare thing? Or is it? Sure, it's a rare thing. It's yeah. a pretty rare thing. So, I mean, I know that Mr. Gowdy already uh, addressed this issue, but have, what sort of policies have you put in place um, or structural reforms that you put in place so that something like the factually, grossly factually inaccurate letter that was sent to Congress um, doesn't happen again, and if it does, that the Department of Justice will act more swiftly in withdrawing that letter so that the members of Congress can have accurate information? Well, I think we've learned lessons here, um, and we've had requests for information regarding um, Fast and Furious since that time um, that, frankly, we have taken more time to respond to. Uh, we have sent uh, interim responses to indicate that we are in the process of looking at information, gathering information to make sure that uh, what we send is, in fact, accurate. I mean, you've got to understand something. This, it is rare, as you said, and it is something uh, about which I have great regret. This is not something I want to have happen on my watch. Um, but I want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. People who are in the department who are involved in that process and who have observed it, I think, have all been sensitized in a way uh, that perhaps we were not before, which is not to say that people were cavalier, but that I think we need to up, the ga up our game and be um, even more careful than, uh, than we had been in the past. Okay. And have you been putting into place other structural reforms to make sure that, I mean, you, you've stated that Fast and Furious was just an abject failure and, and had fundamental flaws that are put into place so that something like Fast and Furious does not happen again? Yeah, um, I think that if you will look at um, all of the things that have been done at ATF, there is, for instance, now a protocol um, that has to be followed at ATF when gun trafficking is observed or when you're doing dr gun, gun trafficking um, uh, investigations. You cannot lose sight of guns. You have to make a decision about when an arrest is going to occur. Uh, what happened in Fast and Furious under the new regulations and assuming that they are followed, uh, it could not happen. In addition, I have sent out through the Deputy Attorney General an edict that makes very clear that gun walking is simply an unacceptable practice. And I, I know that you're aware of this, but there's a number of members of Congress who have who've called for your resignation over this. And so I just wanted to, will you be resigning over from, because of the fallout from Fast and Furious? Uh, I have no intention of resigning. Uh, I'm the Attorney General who put an end to uh, these misguided tactics that were used in Fast and Furious. And Do do you when, think when that I found out about them, I'm also the Attorney General who called on the Acting Inspector General I, to so, so investigate you're not. this matter. Do you I'm think also the Attorney wait, General. Wait, I just I want to ask, who do you, no, who, who? The, you know, the no, gentleman's is, time this, has expired. What, I just need to answer for 15 more seconds. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for an additional 15 seconds. More time the, is fine. Yeah. If I could finish is, my answer. I well, I, I was just asking if it was just a yes or no, and that's, a, that's fine. But do you think that Mr. Brewer or Mr. Grindler should resign or be removed from their posts? On the basis of the information that I have now, no. What about Mr. Weinstein or Mr. Siskel if we're going down another level? I mean, I know Mr. Siskel is over the White House Council, but do you think that they should resign or be removed from their no. On the basis of the information that I have now, no. Okay. Thank you for your uh, Should anyone resign? Hmm? Should anyone resign? Again, on the basis of the information that I have at this point, no. Okay. Now, there have been resignations that have occurred. Um, let us take, let us yeah. not you know, think that nothing has happened here since okay. um, Fast and Furious was Okay. Uh, was exposed. Resignations have occurred. People have been moved in terms of personnel actions. Um, and as I indicated, I guess, in one of my responses to somebody, the personnel actions that I have ordered are initial ones, and I will be monitoring the situation to see if okay. there are other things that okay. I should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quayle. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, General Holder, for being here today. Uh, I just want to follow up on a few points some of my colleagues have touched on uh, today. Uh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Ms. Adams' point that she was making, and that is uh, certainly I worked at Maine Justice. I worked in the criminal division with uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General Chertoff. I understand how much paper uh, comes across your desk and everyone else's desk, and I understand that that um, time is limited and, and you have to uh, you have to do the best you can to process a lot of information. I get that, um, but I think Ms. Adams makes uh, she she raises a good point, and that is, at what point? Do you believe the assistant attorney general or someone else had or has an obligation to particularly, in, in your case with uh, Lanny Brewer, because you have a close relationship or a longstanding relationship with them, um, at what point is there an obligation for one of these senior officials to raise something like this to your level. I understand that they're in briefings and you can't read them all. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that my staff puts in my inbox, but they know that if there's something really urgent, they don't stick it in my inbox. They call me, they come in my office, they get in my face and say, hey, this is very important. So this is not just an operation, or this was not just an operation. This was, in fact, an international operation if taken, uh, if looked at broadly because of the consequences of, of, of these firearms going across the border, and, and that, was, that was part of the plan. So my question would be, at what point is someone expected to raise something like this, knowing that if it were maybe Canada or the UK or some other country, or we were trying to uh, uh, let guns walk, we certainly would, I would think, uh, we would want to inform them or work with them. Help me understand w what your perspective is on that. Because at some level, at some level, someone has to walk into your office and say, this should not be occurring. And I, I want to give you one more fact on that. Uh, Mr. Brewer indicated that when he learned about gun walking, in early 2010, instead of calling the head of the ATF uh, or telling you, he just asked two of his deputies to raise concerns with folks at the ATF. And so in light of what has happened, who and when should they come to you about something like this? No, I think that's a very legitimate question. Um, and Lanny Brewer has indicated um, that the information that he obtained about Operation Wide Receiver and the gun walking that happened there or the failure of the um, mission to stop the flow of guns in, into Mexico, is that is something that he should have brought to my attention, to the attention of the Deputy Attorney General. And I think that's the kind of information that in fact should be. If we had an instance where um, you had evidence of gun walking, either the assistant, whoever had possession of that information, the assistant attorney general, people on my staff, um, that's the kind of information that should have been brought to um, my attention. And as Mr. Brewer indicated, he said that he made a mistake in not doing so. Are there set policies on that now? I'm not sure there's set policies as much as, you know, you've got to look at this information and you've got to just know what are the kinds of things that are routine and need not be brought to my, somebody's well, attention, uh, that which is important. I'm limited on time, so I'm going to try to move quickly here. I, I would just suggest that uh, regardless of what other uh, issues might arise at the Department of Justice, you might want to put gun walking uh, on a list somewhere of something that, that raises flags. The other question, I see my time is, is running, running out. Uh, I want to go back to what Mr. Lundgren asked about earlier. He referred to a CBS article that talked about using anecdotal cases to support uh, a demand letter on long gun multiple cells, basically using a situation created by the government to support a policy argument folks in the government want to make. And you, your, your response was that that was somehow unrelated or it was, it was so far back in time that maybe it, it was unconnected. What exactly was your response on that, well, let me, Mr. Lundgren? Let me, the, the statement, the notion that somehow this operation was used to justify the request for that regulation is simply not accurate. It did not happen that way. The operation uh, was 
conducted separate and apart from any desire to have this long gun regulation. That, that, that's simply not there. Now, the, so that just didn't happen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask unanimous consent for 30 more seconds. Uh, the chairman is recognized without objection for another 30 seconds. Um, well, I, I look further down in that CBS News article, and it says that, quote, on January 4th of 2011, because the quote referenced earlier was July of 2010, on January 4, 2011, as ATF prepared a press conference to announce arrest in Fast and Furious, Newell saw it as another time to address multiple cell on long guns issue. And the next day, he emailed, Chait emailed Newell, Bill, well done yesterday. In light of our request for demand letter three, this case could be a strong supporting factor if we can determine how many multiple sales of long guns occur during the course of this case. I know I'm running out of time. I just ask you to take another look at that. You may not have intended it. I don't know what was going on over there, but clearly some folks had what happened in Fast and Furious. They had that in mind as something to use to support a policy that people in this administration want, are advocating for. So I just ask you to take a second look at that. This is, a, this is an article on CBS News website yesterday. Thank you. Thank well, you, Mr. Clearly, Chairman, and thank you for being here. Clearly an attempt to use Fast and Furious as a way to bolster the request for that long gun regulation would have been uh, foolhardy, given the flawed way in which Fast and Furious was carried out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Griffin. Uh, the very patient gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Amaday, is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Holder, for your patience, too. Um, how, would you, how would you describe your leadership style? I'm sorry? How would you describe your leadership style? Uh, I think I'm a person who um, delegates pretty well. I think I set um, goals that I expect people to meet. I'm not a micromanager. I hire good people. I invest them with the authority to carry out uh, that which I expect them to do. Um, try to give them the resources they need in order to do their jobs. Uh, and I would think that on the basis of what I, I'm being immodest here, what I've been able to do over the last couple of years, two and a half years, whatever it's been at the Justice Department, I think I've done a good job in managing the Justice Department. Do you lead from the front? I'm sorry? Do you lead from the front? Yeah, I think I do. Um, you know, okay. I don't ask anything of the people who work for me that I would not be willing to do myself. I work hard. I work long hours, as, as do they. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield the balance of my time from, to my colleague from South Carolina. Okay, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, has the balance of the time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Holder, there were a series of wiretap applications made to the Department of Justice in Fast and Furious. Do you recall how many? Uh, no. Several. Would you disagree with that? I'm sorry. Several? Um, I, I don't know how many, um, but I have to say that with regard to discussions of wiretaps, there is a limited amount of information that I'm going to be able to share in this forum. Right, and I'm not going to ask you anything that's going to get you in trouble with a federal judge. Please don't. Uh, those applications are voluminous, they're long, and there are factual predicates to support the application for a wiretap, correct? Speaking just generally and not, don't get, right. I'm not getting any trouble here. Speaking generally, that, that's accurate. Are you convinced there is no discussion of gun walking in any of those T3 applications? Uh, I, I, again, I can't get into the... Have you read them? I've not read them, but I can't... Who approves them? Whose division is that? That's is a, that the criminal division? It's in the criminal division. That would be Mr. Brewer? No, no he only approves uh, roving wiretaps. Is he the head of the criminal division? Right, but there are no roving wiretaps in uh, Operation Fast and Furious. But there are several wiretaps. Yeah, wiretaps would that have long factual predicates supporting the, the application. I have not seen them, but I make that assumption. And you haven't read them, so you can't say whether or not yet another Department of Justice official would have been put on notice the gun walking was part of Fast and Furious. Uh, I can't say that, but you cannot say it either. No, I can't. You cannot say the converse. No, I can't. Who, who does Mr. Weich report to? Who does Mr. Weich? Ron Weich? Yeah. Um, I guess on the Justice Department chart, probably through the Deputy Attorney General to me. Well, what I'm trying to get at, it, 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 your defense of your friend Lanny Brewer, I guess at some level, is admirable. I just don't understand it. 
It took me a minute to get you to admit that he knew that guns were being walked, and there are scores of emails where he admitted it. He assigned a prosecutor to Fast and Furious. This is someone who on his own website boasts of being one of the best 100 lawyers in America. He knew that guns were being walked. He assigned a prosecutor to Fast and Furious. He forwarded an email to his home computer of a draft of Mr. Weich's letter. And he's going to stick around, Mr. Attorney General? Well, you're saying things here, you see, but you're doing what I asked you to not do before, and that is conflating things. You, he said, I said he knew about, and he admitted that he knew about gun walking when it came to Operation Wide Receipt. Well, Mr. Holder, the letter is very specific. ATF makes every effort to interdict, we interdict weapons that have been purchased illeg illegally and prevent their transportation to Mexico. Is that true or false? Uh, that is not accurate, but Mr. Brewer didn't, as he indicated, he said he did not have anything to do with the creation. He of forwarded this letter, a draft of it, to his home computer. Now, it does not take a long walk to get that he forwarded it to his home computer to read it. I'm only going by what Mr. Brewer has testified to, which is that he did not think that he reviewed the letter, reviewed the drafts uh, before they went out. That is what he But said. you agree with me. Mr. Chairman, with, with, with regular the, order, Mr. Chairman. With the, with the, the witness should be allowed to, to finish. Would the gentleman from Nevada be willing to further yield? Who's the gentleman from South Carolina has the time. Yeah. I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from California. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Attorney General, if there were seven wiretaps, and they were all approved under the Criminal Justice Committee, where a criminal, uh, the, the criminal division, certainly we would hope that between now and the time you next appear, you would read them, as would Lanny Brewer, in detail, since he approved them through his minions. Let me just go well, through one thing that I have to ask you. Yesterday, understand. we became aware, oh, please. Mr. Attorney General. Hey, Mr. Chairman, regular order, the time has hey, expired. Mr. Attorney General, I didn't hey, ask you a question. Hey, I, I, I simply I, said I'd like you to be aware of The gentleman of that. from California has a time. The gentleman from California is granted an extra one minute to allow the AG to respond. Right. There was no question. You, Here is the question. No, Yesterday, Mr. Attorney General, we became aware that emails Mr. between Chairman. Lanny Brewer and the deputy, uh, his deputy, Jason Weinstein, about Fast and Furious in March time frame that they exist. Some of these, actually all of these, have been withheld the, from the committee. Will you agree to turn over those communications in the March time frame between Lanny Brewer and his deputy, Jason Weinstein? March of what year? 2011. Uh, as I've indicated, um, we are not going to be turning over materials after February. Are you aware that you are, in fact, by doing so, in the fact that we already issued from the Oversight Committee a subpoena, you are standing in contempt of Congress unless you have a valid reason that you express it, that you provide logs which you've refused to provide for the, uh, the other information. Otherwise, you will leave the committee no choice but to seek contempt for your failure to deliver or to cite a constitutional exemption. And the gentleman's time has expired. The Attorney General will be allowed to respond. Um, well, uh, we will respond in a way that is consistent with the way in which the Justice Department has always responded to those kinds of... That's requests. not the question, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, can I, uh, can uh, regular I, order, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Uh, uh, please proceed, Mr. Attorney General. We'll respond in a way that other uh, attorneys general have, other justices... John Mitchell responded that way, too. Regular Mr. order, Mr. General. Chairman. Uh, uh, that, was that called for? I mean, you're, Mr. Chairman? The, uh, he should be allowed. The gentleman, actually, the gentleman from South Carolina has the time, but I'm going to allow the Attorney General. Do you have any further response to that question, Mr. Chairman? To the question, Mr. Chairman, about whether or not he understood that it was, in fact, an act of contempt unless they re recited a constitutional exemption and still had a responsibility to provide us logs, both of which they are refusing to do okay. in testimony gentleman, here today. The gentleman from South Carolina's time has again expired. Do you have a final response, Mr. Attorney no. General? Ms. Adams asked me about um, Congresswoman Adams asked me about political points. The reference to John Mitchell, let's, let's think about that. Think about that. At some point, you know, as they said in the, was the McCarthy hearings, at some point, have you no shame, you know? Um, but in any case, um, I will say that with regard to uh, that, we've made our point clear uh, how we will respond. With regard to the um, question of wiretap information, as Mr. Gowdy knows, there's only so much I'm going to be able to say about um, wiretap information, so reading it 
should not lead anybody to believe that I'm going to be free uh, unless I want to get in real trouble with a federal judge about what's contained in a wiretap okay. application. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, thank you for your testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, be assigned to the Subcommittee on Courts, Commercial and Administrative Law and the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism and Homeland Security. Is there an objection? If not, so ordered. Uh, the hearing is adjourned. Copyrighted material. I would thank the gentleman and just note that uh, with regard to the uh, so, so selective enforcement, uh, there is not currently criteria in the bill, so that would be at the discretion of your office uh, to decide what type of selective enforcement of that law and the new powers that would be given to the Attorney General under that would entail, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Polis. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Holder, Assistant Attorney General Ronald Weich wrote a letter to a member of Congress, February 2011, a letter which was demonstrably false. Your department withdrew that letter 10 months later. When did you learn that that letter was false? Well, I would not characterize the letter as false. I'd say it contained inaccuracies. Well, uh, Mr. Attorney General, it contained material, demonstrably false statements. Agreed? No. You don't think they're demonstrably false when you represent that ATF makes an effort to interdict all weapons going to Mexico? You don't think that's demonstrably false? Not in the way you use the word. Um, you said. Well, how do you know what way I use the word? I'm listening to you. I, I, is it false? Can I demonstrate that it's false? Well, uh, you said materially false. Now, you're, you're using legal terms there. You're a lawyer. And, and so you're, now, now we're, in that, we're in that realm. And you said materially false, and that's a fundamentally different thing. All right. Do you think it was demonstrably false? I would say that it was inaccurate. All right. When did you learn that it was inaccurate, demonstrably false? You know, I'm not sure, but I had concerns about it um, early enough that um, in spite of the expression in, on February 4th, I ordered that investigation on February the 28th, and as uh, it, it's, it was an evolving process. As time went on, um, more and more information became available, and it became more and more clear that that uh, letter contained provisions. And if you take into account the, the Cole uh, uh, memo, if, in fact, people are not 
using um, the uh, policy decision that we have made uh, to use marijuana in a way that's not consistent with the state statute, we will not use our, our limited resources in, in that way. And so I, sure. I, I don't know if I assume that I, I just don't know about that provision. And, and again, yeah, in the case of Colorado, we do have definitions of some of the terms in your documents in our in our Constitution. And I, I would hope that this, this, the U.S. Attorney General for the state would look at that. Now, as you know, the Department of Justice that recently announced a crackdown uh, in California now, part of the issue there, it's my understanding, they did not have a functional state-level regulatory authority. Colorado does have an extensive state regulatory and licensing system for medical marijuana. Uh, and I'd like to ask whether our, our state regulation, our thoughtful state regulation passed with strong bipartisan majorities in both chambers of our legislature, uh, provide uh, any additional protection to Colorado uh, from federal intervention. Well, again, I'd have to, I'm not familiar with it, but I'd have to, to look at it. Uh, but again, our thought was that where a state has taken uh, a, a position as it passed a law and people are acting in conformity with the law, not abusing the law, but acting in conformity with it, um, and again, given our limited resources, that would not be an enforcement priority for the Justice Department. Thank you. I'm grateful for that clarification. Uh, one of the issues that many of the uh, legal regulated um, medical marijuana shops and dispensaries in Colorado brought to my attention is their inability to open banks and bank accounts at most FDIC institutions. Uh, that makes the industry harder for the state to, tra to track, to tax, to regulate. Uh, and uh, in fact uh, makes it prone to robberies because it becomes a cash business as well. Uh, is there any intention of the Department of Justice to prosecute bankers for doing business with licensed and regulated uh, medical marijuana providers in the states? Pained inaccurate information. Well, it, it strikes me that if a statement that false were made to a judge, you would have withdrawn that statement, that brief, that memo, that filing, the moment that you learned it was false. Well, there are and I'm just curious why there's not the same regard for this branch of government that there would be for the judicial branch of government. Well, if you look at what happened over the course of months between the time of the letter until it was formally withdrawn, there were a number of uh, instances where uh, we indicated that we had concerns about what was in the letter uh, in, a test in testimony that Mr. Weitz gave. At one point, I believe he says we are not... I don't remember the exact expression that he used, but he indicated there that we had concerns. In a letter that I sent, I guess, in October, uh, I indicated there were problems with Fast and Furious, which was inconsistent with what the letter said. There are a number of things that happened between February 4th and, I guess, December, November, whenever it is that we actually well, withdrew. Let's go back to February 4th, because there are at least four senior DOJ officials who knew or should have known that letter was false at the time it was delivered. Your chief of staff, Gary Grindler saw a, a map of Mexico where guns were being recovered. He was debriefed on Fast and Furious. He knew that cash was being paid for the weapons in Arizona. Uh, Lanny Brewer, you will concede, knew for a fact that gun walking was taking place in February of 2011. Agreed? No. You, do, you disagree that Lanny Brewer, despite the fact that he's admitted it, knew that gun walking was taking place by ATF. Mr. Turner, you know, there are emails where he admitted it in October of 2010. Hey, now, Congressman, you have to be careful here. He said that he knew about gun walking in Operation um, Wide Receiver. Right, which is why it's very important. Mr. White didn't fast say fast and furious in his letter to, to, to Senator Grant. Again, I would think that consistent with our, the notion that how we use our limited resources, again, if the bankers, the people seeking to make the deposits are acting in conformity with state law, that would not, again, be an enforcement priority for, uh, for, DOJ, for the Justice Department. Thank you. Uh, moving on to another issue with regards to uh, uh, Internet piracy. As you know, the Judiciary Committee recently held hearings on SOPA, uh, Stop Online Piracy Act. I have many concerns with this bill, including an overly broad definition of infringement. Um, as you know, there is uh, a lot of content on the Internet. In fact, as an example, on uh, YouTube alone, there's 100 hours of video that's uploaded every minute. Uh, many of this, uh, many of the videos that have been uploaded contain some type of rights infringement uh, with no intent for commercial gain. Uh, I ask with substantial new powers that would be granted to the Attorney General's office under SOPA, uh, what type of resources would the Department of Justice need to handle the hundreds of millions of prosecutions that would be necessary uh, and indicated under SOPA? 
Well, I mean, I, I think that you have to look at what the uh, what powers we would be granted and then how we would use our resources. Not every matter, um, though it might be a technical violation of a statute, is something that we are going to use our resources going against. I mean, if there's a YouTube upload of something that um, is not intended for commercial use and we don't think there is any great harm, that's not the kind of thing that we're going to be going after. So it's fair to say, given otherwise the absence of tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of resources to go after everybody, there would be selective enforcement of the Stop Online Piracy Act from the Attorney General's office? Well, selective enforcement always, you know, a prosecutor get a little, get a little nervous saying that phrase, but um, there would be an appropriate use of our resources, um, taking into account what the harm is and w always with the thought that what we're trying to do is to uh, protect the, the abuse. The Judiciary Committee will come to order. Uh, before we resume our questioning, I'd like to welcome the newest member of the committee, Jared Polis, from the 2nd District of Colorado. Uh, Congressman Polis was just appointed yesterday to fill a vacancy on the committee, and uh, we are happy uh, to welcome him back. He was on the committee for several years and is back on now. He also serves on the Rules Committee and the House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. And at our next meeting, we'll even go into more details about uh, Mr. Polis, but we welcome him today and uh, we'll be recognizing you immediately for questions. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, draw your attention, Mr. Attorney General, to um, uh, the issues surrounding uh, the regulation of medical marijuana. Um, I wanted to first clarify that there's a, a memo dated October 19, 2009 from David Ogden. I'm sure you're familiar with that memo. Uh, the contents of that memo as advisory to the states is, sti are, are, is still in force. Is that correct? That is still a current memo? Yes. Okay, thank you. And one of the, uh, the issues that was later clarified in a, mem in a uh, memo by James Cole is what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about caregivers, who your memo uh, instructs uh, should not be uh, an enforcement priority. Uh, the Colorado Constitution in Article 14 happens to have a definition of caregiver. It's further refined in our Colorado statutes. And I wanted to uh, see whether I can get your assurance that our definition of caregiver in our state's constitution will be given some deference uh, by the U.S. Attorney General's office. I'm not familiar with the provision, um, but what we said in the memo we still intend, which is that uh, given the limited resources that we have, uh, and if there are states that are uh, that have uh, medical marijuana.